Okay, so good afternoon <coughs> and welcome back. <coughs> so today we are, so this week, we are going to cover the last topic, the really last topic of the course and the, the last things you, you have to do in your group project that is usability testing. And the idea is that today we just cover the theoretical, let's say, part and the process part. And tomorrow we will either finish the slides and start an exercise, a simple usability testing script, or we just do the exercise and the usability testing script. Um, and then on, in the lab, our suggestion is for you to work on the usability testing script in the next lab so that you have feedback in creating the usability test plan. Next week instead, just as a recap, uh, we will do a lecture on Monday, so here this time, uh, focusing on question and answer and <coughs> exam just revising the, the exam rules and the expectation and what you have to do, etc. We won't have a class on Tuesday, next Tuesday, so no class, 5.30, 7 p.m., the last week of the, of the course, and we will have instead a lab in the final uh, Wednesday hmm, of, the, of the semester, still working on the high um, fidelity prototype or usability testing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is the plan for this week. Um, let's start with usability testing. So usability testing. Um, so as a recap, we spoke already with evaluation when we covered the heuristic evaluation, right? So in general, just as a recap, the evaluation is for testing the usability, the functionality, and acceptability of a gener generic interactive system according to different factors, the design stage, the goals, the different dimension, and different techniques are used for doing the evaluation. Um, and the idea of the evaluation is, and always has been in this course, to identify and correct problem issues as soon as they emerge. So in the uh, paper prototype, you can fix something. The mid fidelity, you can fix something. And in the final uh, prototype, you can fix other things. And always as a recap, the evaluation may take place involving users or with expert evaluation. And we already did the heuristic that is an expert evaluation. It could be automated. It could involve the user with experimental methods like the one we are going to, to see partially today, uh, with observational methods and query methods that are more similar to the survey, the interviews, and all these kind of things we did for the need finding. So these techniques can also be used for some level, some kind of evaluation. And they can take place in the lab or in the field. And for in the lab, it means an environment that is controlled by you. So you say, okay, this is one, one chair, one table, three table, one computer, three computer, you have control on the environment, some level of control, or it can be in the field, meaning that uh, you can just evaluate the prototype, the application, as people use in the current environment in the current context, so around in the city, at home, etc. Hmm? So different places uh, where this evaluation can, can apply. So which is the difference between the expert evaluation and the user evaluation? So the expert methods like the risk evaluation are typically faster than the user study. Uh, results are pre-interpreted. Hmm? A good risk evaluation will give you this page fail, doesn't meet three heuristics, and specifically these three heuristics. So there is a problem with that button specifically. So results are pre-interpreted because you have an expert evaluator, uh, could generate false positive in some cases, might miss some problem, 
because they are focusing on the heuristics following some specific heuristics and not generic usage of the application but it's clearly useful for filtering and refining the design and the overall application user studies such as usability testing um, are slower than a heuristic evaluation and you need to develop let's say the software in our case and prepare the setup and tweak the application according to what you want to measure and collect information from are more accurate by definition because they use actual users use doing actual tasks the task that they will typically do in their uh, environment in their usage expected usage of the application and usability testing tend to occur in the later stage of development user studies in general tend to occur in the later stage of development of a prototype it can be done on a paper prototype but clearly some things are not uh, immediately uh, available or understandable because of the nature of the paper prototype mm -hmm. and similarly labs versus field usability testing is an evaluation in the lab not in the field means that you can have equipment available you want to record you can record you want to video record you can do it you want to have timers you can have timers so you can have equipment and environment is the one you set up you want to set up a room with no other people except the person that is evaluating you can do it it's you have the control on the physical environment where the evaluation is taking place and these are advantages. The disadvantages are that uh, in the lab evaluation I have a lack of context. If you want to try an application of people doing shopping, grocery shopping, well, if you are in a room like this, you cannot really simulate the real context of a supermarket. So this is a, a disadvantage. And it's also difficult to observe several users cooperating in case the application as multiple users involved. Uh, it's surely appropriate if the system location is dangerous or impractical and for constrained single user system and for usability testing is always done, almost always done in the lab. Uh, the evaluation in the field, we are not going to, to cover that, but just quickly, uh, it has very ad some advantages. The environment is natural, the context is retained. If you want to try a grocery shopping application, you will see how people will use it in doing grocery shopping along three weeks of usage. So you can also have longer time span. Um, it has disadvantages like distraction, noise, the environment is raining, is not raining, but all of this is part of the context that to bring with, with it. And it's, a, it's more appropriate when you have the context is crucial or for longer study. You want to observe the behavior or change of behavior in three weeks, in one month something that you cannot do in, in, a, in, a, in a session, in a room for a few hours. Uh, we are going to focus on usability or user testing, hmm? the, the column uh, on the right, this one. Um, and the idea of usability testing is, there, is this one. Let's find someone to use our application, our website, so that we'll get some feedback on how to improve it. That is the basic idea behind usability testing. Let's have something mostly anecdotally and observation driven. Let's see how people will use it, doing some activities, and we'll get some feedback. Hmm? This is the usability testing. Very, very simply, usability testing that we are going to, 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 to speak about today. There is another method that is in the family of user studies involving users, not expert users, that we are not going to see in this course, but just to say they exist, and they are called controlled experiment, and they are scientific and driven by an hypothesis. And compare the sentence between usability testing and control experiment. Usability testing say, let's find someone to use our app so that we can get some feedback. Control experiments say we want to verify if user of our app perform a given task faster, more accurate, 
with fewer error than another application, than another version of the application. It's controlled, but it's also a comparison most of the time in which you want to see if a given task is done better with some metric than another thing. Hmm? So this is a control experiment. That's scientific. You have an hypothesis. You make an hypothesis that your application is faster in doing that task than another application. And it's control experiment. And we are going instead to focus on usability testing. That is, let's get some feedback on the usability so that we can improve it in our application system, whatever. So usability testing, the goal are similar to the goal of a generic evaluation. Identify problems, identify usability problem in the design, uncovering opportunities to improve the design of the running application and learning about the behavior and the preferences of our target population. So for usability testing, you need the user, the same population that you, in a way, recruited for the need finding, the potential user of your application. And if we want to see a definition, we can use this definition by the Nielsen Norman group that say that in a usability testing session, you have a researcher that's called facilitator or moderator that asks a participant, a single participant, to perform one task at a time uh, using one or more specific user interface. And while the participant completes each task, the researcher the facilitator observe the participant behavior and listen for feedback. These are the definition. So you have in a session one person that is the facilitator, or the moderator, the, the one that uh, take the text, the uh, drive the user the usability testing, and ask a single participant to perform one task at a time on a user interface, and then something happens, the task is completed, the task is not completed, is partially completed, etc. And uh, you take note, the facilitator take notes of what happens, and so you know that uh, all the participants are not able to complete a specific task that maybe is one common task, and others instead are, uh, etc. So you get information, you get feedback from that. Uh, usability testing in professional settings happens in dedicated laboratories that are rooms designed and created for running usability testing that are typically split in two so one single room split in two one is the testing room that in the picture is this one the picture is this one so here this person is in the testing room alone in front of a computer with all the equipment that is needed and then there is the observation room that is this one, where the facilitator observes what's going on and can communicate via microphone, via some system, with the person in the room. So the person in the room, the, test, the person that's testing the application, is running the application, is experimenting the application, and the facilitator is observing whatever is happening. Hmm? Uh, and, and typically, the observation room has the uh, one-way mirror, the one that you see in police movies or series, in which you see what happens, but in the other room, they don't see you. Hmm? Uh, and so this is the usability testing lab, the professional setting usability testing lab. Uh, clearly, we don't have usability testing lab, and not all the usability testing happens in these dedicated labs, but the key ingredients are still there. And the key ingredients are that you need the facilitator, you need someone that is doing the test, you need, if it's an application, a computer, a mobile phone to do the application, and you need some system to look at what's going on and to communicate with the tester and to get track of what's, what's happening in the, during the, the experiment, during the evaluation. So to run a usability testing, you have three main steps. The first one is the longer and most complicated. The other two are easier if you do well the first one. And the first one is planning. You should plan the usability testing. So who are the participants, which are the tasks, what you are going to test, where you are going to do the test, 
how you're going to test, which measure, if any, you are going to, to pick, if you are recording, not recording, etc. Mm -hmm. So once you have all the plan, you move to the second step that is actually running the test. So putting the plan in operation. So you call one participant at a time on multiple sessions and do what you plan for. And then at the end of all the participants' sessions, with the data you collected, you can analyze the information collected, both the qualitative and the quantitative information you may collect. So the planning is the central part. And here there are the main things you will need to consider in planning. So first of all, you need to choose who you will involve in the test. So who are your participants, your target user? Again, in our case, they will be probably very, very similar if you didn't switch uh, target user from the one that you got for the need finding because you interview people to, to build something for them. So probably they will be the same kind of user. But yeah, you have to decide who are your participants. And then you also have to decide how many <coughs> participants you need. Uh, and we know from experiment, and here there is a link, that five is a good enough number to get good information from a usability testing session. So it's five participants doing some task. I don't remember if in the assignment we asked for five or for less, probably for less than five participants, fewer participants, uh, but pick the number in the assignment, clearly. Five is the golden number if you need to do it outside of the course, but you can also have more than five. That's five is good enough, the minimum good enough number to have enough information to proceed. And this is again the planning. So who you will involve, how many participants, and which role you are going to play during the test. So you clearly need one facilitator for the session, so the one that is conducting the test. If you don't have a professional usability lab, you may need also one or two people that serve as observer and the taker. So if you are a group of three, you can have one people doing the facilitator and the other two doing the taker, observer, what's going on, just in case the facilitator that cannot catch everything that is happening. Uh, if you are a group of four, you can split the group in two and have two facilitator and two uh, note taker observer and so conduct the usability testing in parallel. Mm -hmm. So uh, between two and three people in total are needed, but again, check on the assignment what we ask you. This is again in general. Typically, we are in this course, we are going for the assignment, we are going against this, but in say the real world, developer, designers, creators, etc., of the app, of the interactive system, must not serve as facilitator. Why, according to you, they must not serve as facilitator? Here, we will, because you all created the app, and you will also do the facilitator, but if we have to, to run something else, you will not be the facilitator for your app. Why? What's the problem? And what is the thing you should take care of in doing the usability testing as developer, creators, etc.? They may lead the user to perform the task correctly. They may lead the user to perform the task correctly. They can bring some assumption with them. They can say, oh, but do like this and <sighs> not be enough patient. So it's typically avoid developer, design and creator to be facilitator. They can be note takers. They could be uh, observers, but not leading the task, the, the test, just to avoid this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. So the facilitator is typically a person that is familiar, know, know what is the application, know which are the tasks that can be done, but does know the details on these things work, not to bring the knowledge uh, on how things work specifically within the test. And so not lead or bias the, test, uh, the tester um, in this sense. So once you choose what you are going to do and, 
and um, how many participants and what you're going to do, you have to choose which task. Hmm? Uh, and these tasks are, let's say, children of the task, the three tasks you have. Hmm? So your tasks are sort of high level for these, the subtask of the task you have, in a way. Uh, and task may be introduced by, with a scenario. Since you don't have the context, you can create a context. Oh, you are using this application to learn uh, computer science that you don't know anything about. So you are at home and you can open the, your tablet and use this application, etc., etc. So you can introduce everything with a scenario, a story, and then give the task. Now you want to, I don't know, complete uh, the first level of the application. So task may be introduced with a scenario. It's not mandatory. It's sometimes useful to set the context. Uh, task might be concrete and with a real goal, hmm? but you should already know this about task. And a usability testing typically have between five and 10 tasks hmm? to be done for a tester. Uh, closer to 10 than to five is typically the average number. Then it could be 12 or 13. In some cases, if this application is big enough or complex enough. Not too much, because otherwise you will have a user doing a usability testing for five hours, and then the results will be also be afflicted by uh, the fact that the person is tired, etc. So choose the task, write down the task, uh, choose any methodology you are willing to apply to the task. We will see a couple of them. Methodology, think aloud is a methodology, cooperative evaluation is a methodology, nothing is a methodology to, to choose, it's not mandatory that each task has a specific methodology, but you can have a methodology attached to a specific task. Uh, and then you have defined detailed success failure criteria for each task. So when the task is successfully completed or not, or partially completed or not, and which error are critical error and which error are not so critical error, so the task is sort of completed anyway. You also have to decide, you have to decide quite a lot of things. You have to decide whether you want or you need to ask any additional information around the usability session before or after the test, before or after each task, or before or after a meaningful group of tasks. And this additional information could be three questions of a survey, for instance. So you have to decide and then you prepare the, the question uh, and the answer if it's a closed answer question. Then you need to select which equipment you need with respect to the criteria, to the methodology and to, to the task you created. So you want to measure time, you need to set up the environment so that you can measure time. And importantly, you need to prepare an informed consent for, form for participant to fill. So similarly to the interview, you, have, you ask permission to do the interviews here. You also ask permission to do the usability testing and to collect the data from the person. Again, there may be questionnaires, and so you may want to, the permission, you want the permission to collect the questionnaire. The last thing you have to decide is to decide whether you want a debriefing session at the end of the test for each participant. So the debriefing session is a session, so you do the test, maybe there is a questionnaire, and then you thank the, the person, and before the person leaves, you say, okay, let's speak for 10 minutes about how the test is, was gone. Or I noticed that you did this thing in this way. Why? when you select these instead of that, why you choose this path instead of that. Hmm? So something that the note taker, something that the observer observed, may be different from other participants, may be different from expected. So it's a, a, a conversation, a chat with the uh, participant. And this is called debriefing. Hmm? So it's not part of the test, it's not measurement, it's not using the application anymore, it's just speaking with them for a couple of minutes with some maybe predefined question with some open question according to what happened during the test. 
uh, to better understand some pathway or to better understand some comments or something that happened during the test. So these are all the set of decisions you have to take. And after you took all the decision, you also have to develop a written test protocol that is called script, like a movie script. This is a test script for consistency among uh, sessions. So you write down to the exact wording what you are saying to each participant so that the information and the instruction you give to participant one will be identical to the instruction you will give to participant 10 or to participant 5. Everybody will get exactly the same information from you. So you will not have the risk to give more information or less information to a person or another. So you write this, this test protocol, you write the script, um, and then you, once you've done all the decision, all the script written, you typically practice your script with a friend or with a colleague so that you can fix things that are not clear or that are maybe clear to you but not to, to another person so that you can fix these bugs so you don't waste your and your user time in doing that. So like beta testing of the script before actually doing the testing with some people. It could be your friend, your colleague. It could be also outside of the target population. You just need to um, bug fixing, let's say, the script. So let's see some of these uh, decisions more in detail. So participants. Participants should be the realistic user of the application, the product, the service, the system, whatever. Uh, they could be people that already use the system, if it's an improvement of the system, or the target user group, or similar to the user group. Same things we basically said for need finding. And participant should represent the intended communities with attention to the background they have, if they're using computer system, the background you expected them to have with computing system and experience with the task that you are going to give them. And in some cases, motivation, education, and ability with the natural language used in the interface. Again, nothing really different from what we said for the finding or for the paper prototype. If you speak to doctors, you can use medical languages. If you speak to something that is not doctor, you probably don't want to use the same medical language that you will go using in an hospital, for instance, but adapt the natural language to um, a specific people. So again, this is nothing really new. The facilitator guides the participant through the test process. They give instruction, answer any question from the participants and ask follow-up question, but they must not influence the participant behavior. They just have to give the task and see how the task is unfolding. And then after a certain time, if the task is completed or not, give another task to the person. So instruction until the end of the test hmm? or questionnaire or whatever is needed to the uh, person that is doing the test. If you have a server and you will probably have a server, they will just focus on observer participant will just Again, an observer, like an observation in need findings, observing what's going on, taking notes, what's happening, and not interacting with the person. Only the facilitator speak with the, um, the tester until the debriefing session. So if you have a debriefing session, also the observer can speak with the tester participant because the test is basically over at that point. Uh, the informed consent form is a professional ethic practice that ask all participants to read, understand, and sign, in some way, a statement which say these five things. One, I have freely volunteered to participate in this experiment. I have no constriction. I don't have a better grade if I do this. I've been informed in advance what my task will be and what procedure will be followed. So this application is for X and you will, and this is the goal of the application. Hmm? So what's the goal of the, the experiment? Uh, I have been given the opportunity to ask questions and have my question answered to my satisfaction before starting the test. Uh, I'm aware that I have the right to withdraw consent and to discontinue participation at any time. 
without prejudice to my future treatment. So you go through the test and at task number four, the participants say, I don't want to continue and this person is free to stop the test and go away and you will have to throw away all the information you collected for that person up to that point if this happened. Mm -hmm. So the participant has the right to withdraw the consent and leave the test at any moment if it's something discomfort or different from expectation. And five, the signature below is an affirmation, the all, the above statement, and it's given before starting the actual or showing the application. So you give information, you set up, okay, this is going to happen to, to last 30 minutes, and then before starting, you give the informal consent form. If the person signed the form or accept the form in some format, if it's online, for instance, you can proceed. Otherwise, you cannot proceed with the test with that specific person. Task. We already spent a lot of time speaking about task. Let's just wrap up some things and um, contextualize them better for what we mean for task in this specific case. So I told you that these are sort of subtasks or your three tasks that you have. So the task should be defined according to the main goal that the user has on your system or application. So you don't want to say participant do X with no explanation, but you typically want to, again, situate the request with a scenario. So it sets the stage for the next section and explain why the user is doing X. Uh, and also provide context if needed. So the engagement with the interface and the knowledge about the scenario and about where the interface is located, it's, it's easier to get and creates less problem going on. Mm -hmm. So if the, the task is expected to happen at home or in an office or a supermarket or at the university, but you will do in a room, in any room, so that will set the, the expectation that, okay, I am at home, I should imagine to be at home. So I will imagine for that moment to be at home, so it will be alone or will be the phone ringing and other things that may not happen in other places. So tasks should have the two characteristics that we already have seen actually in the past. One should be realistic and one should be actionable. Especially in your case, you want tasks to be actionable because you want to know if it's complete or not. So if the user goal, that is the, your, your task, is browse product offering and purchase an item, a task for usability testing, a poor task for usability testing could be purchase a pair of orange, orange Nike running shoes, and a better task could be buy a pair of shoes for less than $20, $40. Hmm? So why the second task is better than the first one? Why buy a pair of shoes for less than $40 is better if your goal is browse offering of products and purchase an item than purchase a pair of orange Nike running shoes. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's one factor. The better task is surely better because you, it's more precise on the amount of money that typically is one factor that one person consider while buying something. So you want to buy something in this range of price between zero and 40 in this case, or between 40 and 90, but not maybe $1,000 for a pair of shoes. So that is something that makes it more realistic. Another one, another thing, that make it 
better from a realistic perspective. How many of you will buy an uh, orange pair of shoes? Maybe some, yes. But how many? How many? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Two people and the half. Okay, so see? Not all. Not everybody. So this is making it less realistic in a way. Because maybe you want, or maybe you ate Nike shoes. So why? you are forcing me. So it's making it less realistic. It's giving you the possibility, if you want, to buy an orange Nike running shoes for less than $40, the better task, if you want. But if you don't want, you can buy a gray Adidas um, not running shoes for less than $40. And it's up to you. It's up to your personal uh, decision. So in a way, you separate the personal flavor, orange, Nike, etc., from the more objective, as he was saying, let's say, I have a budget to spend. I cannot spend $1,000 for a pair of shoes, so I will give some constraint, but some freedom in the other way. And this is about realistic, actionable. Again, your main task is find movies and show times of the movies. The poor task is, you want to see a movie Sunday afternoon, go to, fund with a little bit of context, hmm? you want to see a movie Sunday afternoon is the context also, go to uh, fandango.com and tell me where you would click next. And it's the poor task. And the better task is use fandango.com to find a movie you'll be interested in seeing on Sunday afternoon. Again, why? One is better. Why one is more actionable than the other? So how many actions there are in the poor task? Okay, you're saying the second one, it makes more explicit that you have to use Fandango to find a movie. The first one is, the poor task is more generic, say go to Fandango. And then you imagine that on Fandango there will be some movies because of the sentence before, but the second one is, more, is clearer. That's true. Another thing. Yes, and then there is another problem in the poor task. I can tell you the problem and then you can tell me why. Why this is bad? You don't click, first of all. You tell me where to click. So I'm not completing a task on the application. I will tell you, well, I will click there, but without actually clicking. So that's one thing. Instead here, you will find a movie, and then you will go probably to the page, in this case, to the movie. So there is not telling. It's a task actionable on the application on the system, on fandango.com in this case, okay? So in thinking, you have to, from the three tasks you have, you have to define 
a bigger number of tasks for your application. Clearly, they derive from these three. Hmm? They are specialization. In a way, your three tasks are what here is called the user goal, in a way. Hmm? You have to specialize them a little bit to make it realistic and actionable on the application without giving clues and describing the steps. Hmm? So, if your main task is give the possibility to look, for, to look up grades, a uh, really bad task is go to the website, sign in, and tell me where you would click to get your transcript. This is what the person needs to do step by step. Go there, then log in, and then tell me, as before, where you would click. A better task is look up the results of your midterm exam. And so to do this, you need to, to, to log in, clearly, and show the transcript on, on the screen. And say, here, there is the results of my midterm exams. Mm -hmm. Also, avoiding to use, it's not written or it is somewhere else, avoid to use the same terminology you use on the application. So in the application you use find, in the task you use search, for instance. If the application use uh, login and you really need to, to say login, say sign in use different terms to explain what you need to do. So no clues, no describing the step. Give the task that the person should complete in a realistic and actionable way, if you want, with a scenario in front of it. Maybe not all tasks need a scenario, maybe the first one need a scenario and then the others are building on the scenario you already gave. Metrics. So you have tasks, let's say that you have 10 tasks. At a certain point, you will need to be able to say if the user, the participants, completed the task successfully or not. And you can have two kinds of metrics. One are subjective metrics that are questions you ask participants. For instance, background information, ease of use, satisf satisfaction, after a task of the entire application, likelihood, likelihood to use or recommend the application to others, etc. And then you have quantitative metrics that are what you will be measuring in your usability testing, like successful completion rate, how many tasks were successfully completed, error rates, how many errors were made, time on task, how long was the time on a specific task of the participant, etc. Hmm? And notice, so, why I didn't call it this qualitative matrix, but subjective? Yes, these are subjective because the, the questions are given by a person like the, uh, your satisfaction of the application. But that's, that's why it's called subjective. Why we cannot say subjective qualitative matrix? How will you measure the ease of use? With a scale between 1 to 5, and 1 to 5 is not qualitative, it's quantitative, it's a number. But it's subjective because it's my perception of. So it's not qualitative versus quantitative, it's subjective versus 
non-subjective but also quantitative in this case because error rates, successful compression rates are numbers. Uh, so here there are a list of possible metrics. You don't have to use all of them, but these are a pretty long comprehensive list. So you have, you, most of the time you have a successful task completion because you have tasks and you want to know how many people completed it successfully. So that is something that you typically have. Uh, and a task is successfully completed, I'm reading here, when the participants indicate in some way that they have found the answer or completed their task goal. So if I have to look for my results from an exam, the task is completing as soon as I have find the results to the right exam. And the task completion could be measured in various ways. The two ways are either Boolean, it's completed or it's not completed, or on a scale between, let's say, 0 and 100, or 0 and 10. What does it mean that a task is successfully completed 80 or 8 out of 10? How can be partially successfully completed. It can be, because I'm telling you, you can measure with a scale between 0 and 100. So you can say 0 is not completed, 100 is totally successfully completed, and 50 is 50, completed just half of the task. But I'm counting it as partially completed. Why? <coughs> didn't find any shoes at all. So it's a bad, a bad task. If the task is find the shoes and the application doesn't have shoes, it's but no. yeah. <laughs> Or for the pricing. But again, if the task is asking for a specific price, the application should be able to provide at least one answer <laughs> to that specific query. But actually, it's not a really bad example. So let's say that the task is, and it will bring us to the non-critical errors. Let's say that the task is find a pair of shoes uh, less than $40. And you have filters in the application, and the person by mistakes, instead of writing 40, writes 30. And, or 50. And then the person selects uh, a more expensive shoes. So technically, the task is not completed because you wanted 40 dollars or less. So it's not totally successfully completed, but you can count it as partially completed because that is a non-critical error for the task. Because the task, what was the goal of the task? The goal of the task was, in that case, finding a pair of shoes and using a filter to arrange for a certain amount of money. So you can say, and it is a, a, about you as running the planning, is a bit testing, you can say that, yes, the task was not successfully completed because it's not less than 40, but it was a mistake of the person typing 50 instead of 40. Uh, so it's sort of completed, it's partially completed, and it made a non-critical error. So errors that are recovered by the participant and do not result in the participant's ability to successfully complete the task. These errors result the task being completed less efficiently. Or, again, you want 40, but the person select 50 and then select a pair of shoes and they say, no, no, it was 40. And so go back, fix the thing, and etc. So it makes the task less uh, efficiently completed. And you can say, okay, but since of this double checking, etc., etc., it could be a usability problem that maybe it's not 
immediately easy to select 50 or 40 or whatever as I want to penalize myself as the test as the facilitator of the of the session to uh, not counting the task as successfully completed and removing 10 points or 20 points on one under scale uh, instead there are critical errors critical errors are deviation at completion of our target of the task so that the participant cannot finish the task and participants may or may not be aware that the task goal is incorrect or complete so let's say you want to find some shoes less than $40 and then in the end the person select a t-shirt less than $40 or more than $40 that is not completed because it's not a shoes it's a it's a t-shirt and it's not less than $40 more so that's a critical error that will not give the completion of the task and the participant maybe at the end say okay I'm, I'm done next task so not even recognizing that the task was different from the one that uh, was given in this case it's it's hard to to to, conf to to mess up between a pair of shoes and a t-shirt but in other cases where maybe the difference is smaller it could be it could happen and then with that you can also compute the error free rate if you want the percentage of participants who complete the task without any error so 80 percent of a participant completed the task one without any error at all you can also have time on task depending also the methodology you're going to use uh, time on task is the amount of time it takes the participant to complete the task and the measure is time so seconds minutes etc uh, you can have as matrix subjective measures like questionnaire sell this subjective measure we we mentioned before satisfaction ease of use ease of finding information etc typically in a likert scale and then you can also have open question with like dislike and recommendation as form of free text and for subjective measure and open questions there are existing standard or sort of standard validated questionnaires that you can use so you don't have to create the questions on your own the, the question on your own but you can use uh, questionnaires that exist task succession rate completion rate is one of the more common metrics it's typically used in all usability testing because you have a task uh, again in a simple form it's binary done or not done but in case of partial success you can use this range between uh, 0 and 100 so here there is an example you have to book a room of a given size in a given date and for a certain amount of time through the polytechnic website and you can define different level of success like the user booked the room with an error exactly as specified as complete success i want to book a room in the p area for hosting 100 people at 2 p.m on wednesday and i am able to do it completely i can say success with one minor issue like the user book the room but select a wrong size instead of saying 100 they say 80. you want to count it as completed as an example of before with a non-critical error and so just to reduce the success then you can also imagine to have a success with a major issue just removing more points like the user booked the room so the task is completed the room is booked but in the wrong date or for the, the wrong amount of hours so it's more significant than maybe the size of the room that you have to select between large medium and extra large and you click on extra large it could be just also uh, an error in clicking is not maybe so significant so you can consider a minor issue but if you instead of wednesday you put monday or instead of 2 p.m you put 8 a.m that is a more distant way to make uh, an error so that could be a major issue in that case if your goal is to verify that the user is able to successfully complete a booking of the room with some criteria 
additional criteria, that could be a major issue. And a total failure could be the user is not able to book the room. So book a room here with that size at the time and I'm not able to do it. I'm trying multiple times, but at the end I'm not able to book a room at all. That is totally failure. So you can have different levels. And here there is also an example. So out of 20 complete success. Uh, so you can report it like 20 people. We don't have 20 people. But 20 people completed success. Uh, the task, 35 with minor issues, like place an older but minor issues, with the major issues, and totally failure. So this is clearly a, a bigger, hmm, because they get 100 hmm, people, or they put it in 100 to make percentage. So a, big chunk of people. That could be done on a single person and uh, on a single task as well. So in selecting tasks you can also use two different methodology or nothing. One methodology is think aloud. And the methodology say this, while a participant perform a task, the participant is asked to describe what she is doing and why, what she is thinking, what is she's thinking is happening etc so is thinking aloud is speaking what she's thinking is happening hmm? so i'm now clicking here and i'm opening this page and i'm expecting to see in this page this information and i'm scrolling down this is thinking loud whatever i think i will also speak it and tell it to the facilitator there are advantages and disadvantages the advantage is the methodology that's simple Clearly, you just need to speak what you are thinking and can provide useful insight if it's a simple method uh, because you can see what the person is expecting to happen or why he's clicking one button instead of another, maybe it's the wrong one. So you can get some clue. As disadvantages, this is highly subjective, but if you have multiple people doing the same reasoning, then you can learn something. Uh, and the act of using this methodology may alter the task performance. For instance, you typically don't do time on task if you are doing think aloud, because you are speaking, so you are uh, altering the time you need to complete the task, because you are speaking also while doing the task. So the time will be longer than without speaking, but you don't know how much longer. So typically, if you have think aloud, you don't have time on task as a metric for that specific task. Maybe you have four others. Hmm? Another methodology is the cooperative evaluation that is even ter is more terrible for the time on task metric. And it's a variation of think aloud. So the idea is that the facilitator and the participant collaborate during the uh, development of a single task, which this methodology is created. So one person say, I would like to click here, what do you think? And the other reply. And so there is an exchange of information in doing the task. Clearly, this, um, for, for this is very need, is needed that the facilitator is not the developer or creator of the system, because otherwise it will bring a lot of knowledge into, into this kind, because it's cooperative. So they are cooperatively evaluating that part of the application. Um, there could be clarification possible in advantages. The user is encouraged to criticize the system because it's speaking with another person. So you can say, but this is not how we would have done, etc. So you can get, again, feedback and information. Then you have to decide what to do with this feedback and information. Um, equipment, and then we will continue tomorrow. Uh, equipment, you will probably need some equipment. We will not have a usability lab, but maybe you will need some recording equipment. Or maybe you don't want to record because you have enough observer and note taker, so you don't need to record anything, audio or video, because you are taking plenty of notes. Or it could be done also remotely with participants in different locations, so everything is on Zoom or Google Meet, etc instead of a physical room. But you have equipment, 
So if you do it in a room, you need to book a room, you need to find a moment for everybody, you need to, if you record, you need to bring a recorder, etc. If you're doing it remotely, you need to set up call, you need to be sure that the screen sharing is visible, that there is a webcam to see the person, otherwise you cannot observe, etc. So some material from the basic one, paper and pencil, you can take notes, etc. You can collect audio, especially if it's good for thinking aloud, so you can re, uh, replay what the person was saying. Uh, you can also have video, but the fact to put a camera in front of a person can alter the behavior of the person, so maybe into ostrusive. You can have computer logging. So you can, do you want to measure time on task? Let's have a software, let's have your application that measure the time of task instead of having a timer. Um, but again, if you're large amount of that data, you then you have to analyze all of them. In practice, there is a mixed use for the material. So you have some note taking, some audio recording, and some automatic support. So like for timing, I will instrument the application to measure time because it's easier to instrument the application than not to keep time with a timer. Uh, but I will also take some notes and we use the audio just in case I have problem with the notes. Okay, we will continue tomorrow with the post-test questionnaire and how to use it and then we're almost done and we will continue with the, uh, the exercise tomorrow because we should have in the room, if don't, one person I don't remember the name, we didn't have it, her, so we continue. Let me see. <laughs> there was some students doing a survey on the quality of air of these rooms. Um, and they should come here today, now. but I don't remember the name. Tugana? No? Okay, let's speak about post-task question. And then if the person um, came, we will stop. This person should have some question for you about the quality of air in this room along the semester. Um, so there are, as I was telling you, that there are specific existing questionnaire validated so you don't have to, to make up all of them. There are two kinds of questionnaire. One is the post-task questionnaire. So a questionnaire you do after each task. So you have 10 tasks, you do the questionnaire to be done 10 times. And then there is the post-test questionnaire or pre-test questionnaire. So after the test, the entire test session, after 10 tasks, you uh, give the questionnaire. So one questionnaire for the entire, se the entire um, session. So uh, there are many more post-test questionnaire than post-task questionnaire. One post-task questionnaire that is standardized and can be used is this SEC. SEC stands for single is question. Why it's called single is question? Because post-task questionnaire in general must be short because you are doing this multiple times and so you don't want to ask five questions. You want to ask one and quickly uh, to interfere as little as possible with the flow of the usability testing. So the simple, the single is question exemplified this very well. It's one question that is overall, this task was one, very difficult, seven, very easy. So also very easy answer to give for a task. So Likert scale, one to seven, and it's a standard test. It's a standard questionnaire, so you can use it. But this is a post-task questionnaire. So you can decide to use it after one task, after all the tasks, but the post-task questionnaire, you should be very careful to be short and then if you are interested in getting this information about a specific task. 
Way more common are the post-test questionnaire, like the SUS. SUS is widely used. You can also create post-test questionnaire of your own. These are standard questionnaire, but you can also create your own. Uh, the SUS questionnaire stands for System Usability Scale, and by its inventor, it's called the Quick and Dirt Usability Scale. So the idea is that it's quick, but it's also dirt, so it's not particularly accurate. And it measures the perceived usability of the system, mm. and not the perceived usability. So not the actual usability, but usability that is perceived by a person. And it is a questionnaire with 10, ans 10 questions, <coughs> with five Likert option for each question. One to five for ten times. It produces a score between zero and one hundred that is not a percentage score. It's just a number. There's nothing to do with percentage. And a good perceivability of an application is a SU score of 68. So 68 is a score that an application has to be considered above average. So if you run usability testing, you do the SU score at the end of the test, and you get 70, your application as a perceived usability is a little bit more above average. If you get 80, even better. But this is not percentage, it's just a number. <coughs> this is standard. So you, if you Google SUS questionnaire, you can download it, the PDF. Hmm? Uh, look at this question. Notice what happens between question one, two, three, four, etc. So question one is positive or negative? Sentence one, statement one, is positive or negative? The second. The third, it always alternates positive and negative. Hmm? So you have to give, participants have to select one to five for one positive, one negative, one positive, one negative question, up to 10. And then there is a way to calculate the SUS score from this uh, questionnaire. And the calculation mode clearly take into consideration that some questions are positive and some questions are negative. And this is also done to uh, create, um, so that if I want to select five to all of them or one to all of them, I'm not just saying it's terrible or it's very, very good. I'm just saying it's average, basically. So random question immediately get that the person is not paying attention, but it also give a, a, an average score. So. Each answer is, so you calculate the SUS score in this way, you have to do it manually, or with a software, but it's simple. Each answer get between one and five points according to what the person selects. For every odd number question, you subtract one from the score. So if you get five, it's five minus one. For the other question, the even number, you subtract the score from five because one is negative one and the other one is positive. Then you sum the score that you get in this way and multiply the total by 2.5. It's quick and dirt. It's not accurate in that way. 2.5, I don't know where it came from, but 2.5. And you get this number between 0 and 100 in this way. There are clear advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that the reliability of the score has been evaluated. So the SUS questionnaire was created when you weren't even born, I think, in 1986. So it's in use since 1986. That means that there are decades of study and usage of the SUS score. So the reliability of the score has been evaluated over decades and is still for the perceivability on pair with more complex and more costly method.
So the results are reliable. It's perceived, but still reliable. It's free. It's quick because it's 10 question. It's quick and it's also simple as a questionnaire. It's quite used in industry and it's also applicable to a wide variety of technology, system and product because it speaks of more generic, generic, general factor about a user interface. It doesn't have specific question for your user interface, but in, gener in general for user interface. It has some disadvantages as well. It's a subjective measure of perceivability, so it cannot be your only method. You should have successful rate, error rates, time on task, other metrics. Cannot be just this, but this is one powerful tool at the end of the test, the, the test if you want to use. It gives no clue on how to improve the score. You get 70. What do you want to do for, to improve 70? Who knows? The SUS questionnaire doesn't give you any idea, any clues on how to improve that. So it's not diagnostic. It's just a picture of the current version. And then you can make change and you will maybe increase or decrease that score. Again, it should not be your only method. You should have other methods to understand which are the problem. And it's also not possible to make com systematic comparison between two systems and their functionality using, using SUS. So you cannot say um, that your application is getting 70 and your application is getting 80, so that application is better than this. You cannot. You can say this application is a little bit more than average and this other is even more above average. You cannot compare to score because they are not percentage. And we can stop here. The person is not coming, but the next class is, is here. So we can stop here. Tomorrow we will speak about the desired post-test questionnaire just for your knowledge. Uh, and then um, we will see some sample scripts and we speak about running and analyzing the results <laughs> and doing the, the exercise. Uh, if you have any questions, we're still probably here for three minutes before he is arriving. And then um, otherwise we will see you tomorrow in room four. Have a nice evening.